visiting, we usually send out the sermons earlier, so if you can kind of just send that off to the people who are visiting, we can, we can get that to you just by email. But uh, when we're coming up to a close in our book of Joshua here. You know, when, when I say the end, what comes to mind? Some will think about their struggles and the fights that they are battling currently, and they're just waiting for the end. Maybe that even is the end of your university studies, right? Your, your hope is based off the end. When is the last time you felt the refreshment of a battle well fought? I remember in high school, I used to run track, and I, I didn't do like the, the short kind of running. I didn't do the long distance, but it was just like right in the middle. And uh, the very first time I joined, my coach, I guess, my track coach, he, uh, he, he threw us right into the first track meet. He didn't, we didn't really run much or anything. He didn't really teach us how to run. He just said, okay, it's, it's time to just get your feet wet. Go, go and jump into it. Mm. And so I was running kind of a distance of 800 meters, which is pretty much around the lap twice. And uh, it was me and one of my best friends that just randomly joined. And uh, I was just so nervous, so excited and everything. And I felt like I had something to prove as well. And uh, I remember I was just right when the gun went off. It was kind of not a real good, a little crap. Uh, but, but right when that went off, I was first place for about like half of the first lap. Uh, I was so nervous and excited. I just started sprinting as fast as I could. I didn't know what I was doing. But by the time it was near the end, I was literally like walking. And uh, me and my friend, we were kind of, because we both started sprinting in the beginning. But near the end, we were just kind of like dragging ourselves to the end. We sh uh, I have to say, he did beat me. I went up dead last. But it was one of those feelings. I don't know, have you guys ever seen that um, video where, sorry, the Filipino divers, they, they dove into the water, but they didn't do it very good in the Olympics. And then at the end, they give each other a hand five. That was kind of like me and my friend. Uh, we did actually really bad, but at the end, we were like, we, we made it through. But sometimes when we talk about the end, you guys might start thinking about your joy or your relationships. There's some things that we do not want to end. I remember me and my brother, we used to do this thing where we went to this uh, Chinese restaurant. It was called a Zen Buffet. Uh, it, it was a buffet not too far from our house. And what we would do, we would bring Uno cards, some playing cards, and we would show up right when they opened at 11 a.m., and we wouldn't leave until 4 p.m. Oh. We would just stay all day with our friends and just eating. We did not want it to end. Yeah. But every 30 seconds, we would just see everyone looking at us, you know, <laughs> the people working there. They want us to kick us out. But that, that was something we did not want to end. Sometimes people think, when they hear the end, they, they think of the end of the world. You know, there have been 173 recorded prophecies of the end of the world so far. Wow. And it may come to a surprise to you, none of them have come true. Uh, but the most recent one is from this guy, and his name is Ronald Winland. He's the most recent prophet exclaiming, or, uh, exclaiming that Jesus will return June 9th. So if you guys want to get your calendars out. June 9th, 2019. Uh, so it allows you guys to be married for a little bit. Woo! You might take some comfort. He also prophesied that the world would end in 2011, 2012, and 2013. And uh, for some reason, he's starting to doubt his prophecies now. But he doesn't, he doesn't know. He, he's going on June 9th right now. But, and then we hear the end of our lives. You know, this is something that we're all going to face one day. And that saying is kind of scary, right? That's a scary bit. One day? Well, today's one day. Yesterday's one day. Tomorrow's one day. What, what, when is that day going to come? Right? See, whenever we're facing the end of any sort, there's always, it always brings a certain type of soberness into your life. You can even ask yourself, hey, did, did I give it my all? If I went back to the beginning, would I have done something different? You know, I think about when I was in high school, I, I say I attended Spanish class, I never said I learned it. <laughs> right? I, I was there for four years, I never really learned anything. And sometimes we come to the end, it's like, okay, well, what, what, what would I have done differently? You know, unlike Toy Story movies, there are things that do come to an end. <laughs> 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 Some of you guys are fired up about that. 
I thought, I thought number three was going to be over, but amen. Yeah. But today we're going to be facing the end of Joshua. Okay. Not only the end of the book, is, but by the end of the chapter, he's going to start facing the end of his life. And he starts to actually realize this and come in contact with this. And he's going to start to, what we're going to read today in Joshua chapter 23 through 24, is what was on his heart on his dying days. My title of my sermon this morning is The General's Last Charge. Point number one, denounce other gods. If you guys want to please turn, if you're, if you're using your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter 23. On, See, throughout Joshua's life, you remember he actually grew up as a child in slavery or amongst slavery in, the, in, in Egypt. And so throughout his life, he was always around other gods. Now, what's interesting about the Egyptians during that time is they did not just only believe in other gods. They themselves, especially Pharaoh, believed they were a god. And so when they say, hey, throw off other gods, they're talking about stop following this guy. It's not like some random person or the sun god and everything. He's like, stop following Pharaoh. Stop worshiping him as though they are a god. So we're going to look here at verse 1 through 5 of what is really on his heart in his dying days. It says here, After a long time has passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around him, them, Joshua by then was very, a very old man, summoned all Israel, the elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It is the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance to your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God has promised you. So in the beginning, we start to see that God has already told Joshua the chapters before that, Joshua, you are old. But now we see here, Joshua is actually starting to accept that right now. He says, hey guys, I am very old. Starts to accept it. And he knows here that he, he is dying. And he knows it. See, death has a way of purifying the soul. You start to focus on what's really important. So he calls all of Israel to now, throughout the, the book of Joshua, he only does this for three different reasons prior to this. In the beginning, in Joshua chapter 3, he calls all of Israel him, to him to what? To consecrate them before they cross the Jordan. Guys, you've got to make yourselves holy before we get into the promise of God. Okay, so he calls them that. Then the second thing he does is after they, they conquered Asa, they go up and to renew the covenant of the Lord in Mount Ebal. And so at that time, he reads all of the book of Moses, not leaves out one word. The third time is throughout periodically when he's giving the allotment of land. He calls each tribe to him and gives them away as they're continually conquering the promised land. Now, is this time he calls all of them to him? This time, all he really does with them is he calls them to remember. He says, guys, come all here. I want, I want you to put back on your heart. Remember what God has done for you. He reminds them of all the battles and the victories that they have fought. And throughout what he's saying here, he kind of jumps back and forth, which is quite interesting. He jumps back and forth first, giving God has done all these things. And then he jumps back and forth, hey, I have conquered these lands. And we're like, what is Joshua? What's going on with Joshua? Is he like, you know, battling in his heart? God didn't know I didn't. No, what, what, what's really cool is he starts to understand the partnership of God. He starts to realize by the end of his days, like, it, it, it was awesome that God didn't just choose to do it on himself. But he chose for me to be a partner with him. Wow. You know, God can't do everything alone if he wanted to. He, see, he doesn't want your help. He wants your heart. Wow. And I think that's what Joshua was starting to see here. That when he was going and conquering the promised land, it wasn't just like God had done all of this. He's like, he recognized that God was going through him. He was using him. Yeah, as, as kind of the vessel to do God's will. Come on, that was really cool. Because I think I stopped on this point. Is that you know, we have to remember that we're not only just in God's church. Or we're not just in God's will. We're not just participating in. But instead the Bible talks about that we are part of God's church. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a big difference. 
See, here in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14, it says, Just as one body, though many, has many parts, but all its parts form one body. So it is with Christ. When you are all baptized by one spirit, as, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we are all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Talking about here that when we were baptized, we are not now just a clothing of Christ, but we are clothed in Christ. You know, we're not just a clothing where God can just throw us off. He's saying, you have become a part of me. You are not irrelevant to the body. You know, I talk about this throughout when we talk about the body. If, if, if I said, hey, what's, what's, what's your least important uh, part of your body? I'm like, if I gave you a knife... What, what would you cut off? What would you just be excited to like? Man, this pinky has been annoying me my whole life, right? N nobody would react that way. There's no irrelevant part of your body. It doesn't matter what it is. And in the same way, that's how God feels about us. But that's something that we have to accept in our heart. Because once we accept our, that we are important, then we have to accept our involvement. When you start to realize how important you are, then you have to accept how much, how much you have to be involved. Mm. See, ha have you ever just like stopped working? Talking about like your body didn't do what you thought it was going to do? Uh, see, for me, my, uh, my left hand, for some reason, it can't turn out, actually. I don't know if I broke it when I was, I was a kid, but uh, that's as far as it goes. And uh, so for a while, I tried playing guitar for a while. But instead of playing it how no people normally do it, I play it more like a, you know, like a cello, you know, because I, I can't really turn my, my hand that well. But uh, in playing guitar, I realized that's not my only setback. My fingers just don't do what I want them to do. They just don't work. You know, I try and like click it, and I feel like I'm like sawing the, the guitar more than actually like playing it. Come on, Todd. But, but if you have a part of your body that hasn't worked for a while, you don't just say, oh, well, hey, it's just a pinky, it doesn't do anything. You know, it, it, you start to get worried, yeah. right? Something that hasn't worked in a while, that actually you kind of have to get that amputated. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, that, that's like the body of Christ. God doesn't just say, become of it and do nothing. Mm -hmm. It's that if we realize our importance, then we need to realize our involvement. Wow. See, when you're telling yourself that you're not important, you allow yourself to be less involved. Mm -hmm. See, Joshua had an understanding that his importance was built on the foundation that God was using him. Um, and, and that was to progress his life. So he goes on, he tells them this. And realizes what how he has been used. And he goes and tells all of Israel here in verse 6. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Without turning aside to the left or to the right. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not involve the names of their gods are swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations to this day. No one has been able to stand or withstand you. One of you routs a thousand, but the Lord your God fights for you, just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. I think it's really cool by the end of Joshua's life that his message actually starts to change just a little bit. So throughout this time, we've been talking about whenever somebody came up to another person, whether that was God to Joshua or the Israelites to Joshua, Joshua to the Israelites. What did he always say? He said, be strong and be courageous. Mm -hmm. But now it's changed. Be strong and be careful. It's different. He still has the same message in the beginning. Be strong. Be unmoved. Have a backbone. Have conviction. He says, be it. Don't just have strength in some areas of your life, but be strong. You know, God is your strength. Live like it. Then he says, be careful. I hear this every time someone hands me a baby. Be, be careful. <laughs> it, what, what is he talking about? Be full of care. What does he say about be careful? He says two different things throughout this time. He says, be careful. Here's the Lord, the law. Do not turn to the left or to the right. There are gods out there. Do not associate with them. Do not worship them. You know, making a wrong turn 
and being lost are two different things. Very different. When you make a wrong turn, you don't go straight into panic mode. Oh, I'm lost. Right? That, that doesn't work. You don't just go off one street and think you're lost. No, no. Being lost is, is when you get lost, you don't know that you've made a wrong turn. Mm. See, when you're lost, you don't realize it right away. It's, it's taking you some time to realize how far you've got. It's, it's a slow realization. It's a struggle to find your way. It can even be a denial that, no, no, I, I can make it. I can, I can still do it. I can get back on path. Do you remember one time that I, I first got lost? I, I don't get lost a lot. Everyone thinks I do, okay? mm. but I don't. <laughs> um, but uh, it was when I had my very first job. And uh, this was before smartphones and GPS. See, like Joshua, I'm pretty old, guys. Um, but this was before that time. Uh, you know, I, got, I, got, I went on Google Maps. I, I printed it out. You know, you had to kind of get the paper. I had my bike. So my first job was actually going around and selling knives. Um, and so it was this thing called Cutco, where you would have to, uh, you would have to get like a recommendation to go and sell to somebody. So I was about like 17, 18 at that time, and I had these bag full of knives in this duffel bag. And, uh, I had my little bike and my piece of paper, and, uh, I, I was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go and sell. I, I'm, I'm a salesman. And, uh, on my way over to the house, it, it, it was just hard, because, First of all, it was like a 30 minute like bike ride there. And that whole time I have this bag hitting me in the leg. Oh you know, these, oh these, like, it wasn't just like straight knives or like in this block piece of wood, but I mean, that still wasn't very fun. Uh, and so this whole time it's just hitting me in the leg and uh, I get there and I could not find the house. I was straight door knocking on different houses. And I was riding around for like 20 more minutes, and after a while, I just threw my bike down, threw the bag down, and I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, I don't know what, I, I quit the next day. Uh, and I didn't even have enough courage to go in and quit. I got one of my friends to go and hack the bag in, and then Aww. I just get in the car. Um, but, but I, I, you know, getting lost is not fun. No, and, and this is what Joshua is talking about here. It's like, hey, do not turn to the left or to the right. There's one thing of getting off and coming back on path. He's like, when you start to worship other gods, you get lost. Mm. Don't, don't worship them. And is there any of a less warning as it was then as it is now? He's saying, do not worship, again, today, what other people worship. Do not bend the knee. Mm. Do not worship the job. Do not worship the degree. Do not worship that relationship. Do not worship the, te the temptation of living for yourself. We read this last Friday, jo uh, Jonah 2, verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Yeah. See, when you're turning left or right, you're turning away from God's love. Those things are not made to last. Do not bend the knee to those things. Mm. See, most people start to turn another way because they're following God, but they feel a little bit unfulfilled, unhappy, or un something else. And they think that, okay, I'll, I'll just go off the path a little while. And then they start to get lost in their life. There's a saying that says, do not make a permanent decision based off a of temporary emotion. Do, do, do not get your whole life on track just because you wanted a little bit of fun. See, Joshua, he understood this. And he reminds them of how far that they have gone. And that the only reason they've had victory so far was because God was fighting for them. And he gives them this last challenge. He says, hey, like they've said it before, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. He says, okay, be strong and careful. And then at the end, he says, be strong and and be very careful of your love for God. Be careful. Careful. Nurture it. Feed it. For other things in the world. And he goes back and talks to them. Do not bend your knee, but instead care for your love for God. See, for this morning, I think the challenge is, if there's, any, if there's anything that you have in your life that you're bending the knee towards, you need to leave it. If there's anything that has a form of control about you serving God or not, it's not worth it. 
See, what it was saying here, it doesn't say have no other gods, like other verses can recommend. Right? Sometimes people think of their love for God, well, God just needs to be above other things. When it talks about idol worship, it doesn't mean have God, number one, above your idols. It's saying have no idols at all. Yeah. That's, that's a very different calling than just love for God. See, this is saying if you bend your knees towards anything, it is not worth it and you need to denounce it. See, Joshua throughout his life, he saw so many people turn away and go the other way. And at this point in time, he's saying, hey guys, at the end of it all, you got to make sure that you take care of your love for God. Mm -hmm. Point number two is develop in the promise. See, Joshua continues to warn them. That if they turn away from God, verses 12 through 13, that instead that they will actually be in fact allying themselves with God's enemies. And so when you're a friend of my enemy, you are my enemy, right? And so what he's saying here is that, hey, God is at war with the world. You can't be friends with it and think you're still pals with God, right? There's no, there's no fence area. There's no sitting on the fence. Like you guys need to make a decision. And so he goes on here and he personally says this to them. He says, now I'm about to go, sorry, verse 14. Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of the good promises your Lord, excuse me, the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. You know, throughout this speech that he was giving them, in the beginning, he was just reminding them about the victories. Then he called them to be strong and courageous, gave them a little challenge there. But now all he wants them to do is know that God has never failed. He says, not one. What can you say not one to? Not one. I don't think I could say that to anything in my life. Not one of my words have been heard. Can't say that. Not one of my moments or one of my days has been wasted. Can't do that. Not one of my deeds have been in hate. There's not one thing I can say not one to. It's probably the only thing I can say not one to, right? <laughs> but it says here that God is a God of not one. Throughout the Bible, not one sparrow will, will fall without him caring and knowing. Not one. Would, not one person would be unloved on this earth. Wow. He says here again, not one of God's promises has been failed. Has ever failed. That all of them have been fulfilled. And he calls them to know this with all their heart and with all their soul that not one has failed. Wow. He calls them to know this because sometimes it's not what we feel. Right? He goes, I want you to know in your heart and know in your soul that not one of God's promises has failed you, no matter how you feel. See, when it comes to God's promises, we can get into this feeling where I believe what the Bible says. I, I, I believe in God's promises, but I believe for a long time. When is it going to happen? My only question sometimes that we feel is when? Right? See, our real challenge in our faith today is our challenge is to synchronize our faith with God's schedule to fulfill. That sometimes we, we have faith in God's promises, but He's not doing it in our schedule, so we start to doubt along the way. Instead, if we can just synchronize how our faith is and synchronize that to God's schedule to fulfill, that would be perfect. But, but why doesn't God just answer that question then? Why doesn't he answer the question of when it's going to happen? Well, if God didn't answer that question of when, there would be no challenge. And therefore, there would be no commitment. Think about it. If God told you that at age 29, you're going to get married, what would most of us do? Oh, okay, well, I mean, Mac is in KFC all day then. <laughs> until 29, you know, until I turn 29, it doesn't really matter. You, you, you wouldn't really focus. And in the same way, that there wouldn't be much commitment. Yeah. See, God gives us a promise, but he doesn't give us a schedule because he wants to call us to commitment. Wow. Yeah. He wants to see if our faith is going to last the test of time. Mm -hmm. See here in Matthew 13, verse 31 through 32, I think this is, this is where most of our faith 
faith can be in. He tells him about this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which one, which a man took and planted in the field. Though it is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds can come and perch its branches. You know, throughout the Bible, mainly with Jesus, he always used these parables, mainly because he was speaking to farmers at that time, of uh, sowing seeds and, and reaping the harvest. And, you know, I think what is our challenge, especially in our faith, is to sow, to actually go out and do it. That, that's usually not the problem. That's not the challenge that we are faced with. You know, I, I get what it takes to sow. I know I need to go out there, I need to do hard work, and I know I need, I, I know what I'm, I need to do what I'm called to do. All right, sowing, I, I get that, I get that part. But to reap, okay, I, I get that. Reaping, reaping is easy. All I need to do is go out there and gather what my faith has already done. That's the easy bit, that's the time of a feast, that's awesome. But that middle bit, that bit between sowing and, and reaping, I don't know about that bit. That time spent in the soil after all the hard work and the long hours, that time in the darkness and the unknown of, I don't know what to do now, that's a scary place to be when you have done all that you could and now you just have to wait. In the soil. I think about it though. That's, I think that's where most, most dreams die, though, right? in the soil. You've done the hard work and you're just waiting to reap, but, but you need to make it pass. I think that's where most relationships end in the soil. Where, where potential gives way to apathy. Where most promises of God are forgotten and left in the soil. See, it takes no faith to sow and do the hard work. We, we all know that life is going to be hard work. We all know that. And it takes no, no faith to reap. You know, pass the butter, that's awesome. Like, let's, let's feast. That, that doesn't take much faith. Where the real faith comes is when you are buried in the soil of uncertainty and keep growing. And that's what we all must do. See, there, there are some stages of faith where there is nothing else you can do but just wait. See, he calls them here. He says, God has not failed you, but in a way, are you going to last the soil? Not one of God's promises is ever going to fail you. But are you going to last? Joshua wanted to make sure that they knew that the promises of God have been fulfilled and continue and will continue to be fulfilled. See, those in the church, have you forgotten your impossible prayers from the beginning of this year? Do you guys still pray about those things? I forgot what we named it. Was it impossible prayers or what did we name it? Dreams. Yes, our dreams. Have you guys forgotten dreams? I, I, I name them impossible prayers. Okay. That's what I mean. That's so wrong. <laughs> but have, have you guys forgotten about your dreams? Mm. Have you forgotten that you planted them in the soil and God's going to fulfill them? Yeah. You know, and those that are, that are you know, visiting in the church, do you have dreams? Do you have promises of God that you're waiting to fulfill? Mm. Is your faith lasting the soil? See, in the next couple of verses, Joshua talks about through 15 through 16, that he says you need to take the, the promises of God seriously, but he also says you need to take his threats seriously as well. It's like, hey, if, if you don't do these things, God's threats are going to come on you just as serious as his promises. But point number three, coming up to a, conclu a conclusion, he ends it off with decide to follow God. First, denounce all other gods. Make sure that you, you stay in the promises of God. And at the end, decide to follow God. See, Joshua, between Joshua 24, 1 through 10, Joshua addresses Israel and, and God is speaking through him. And again, he's kind of just going through and narrating all the things that have happened. Uh, doesn't your life sound so much better when someone else narrates it? <laughs> it sounds so much better, right? I think about it. Yeah, our brother Douglas, the last mission team member to join the group. Everyone else flew, but he had to wait a little bit longer in the soil. He came and gave up his life in America 
and flew all the way to Auckland, joining a new family, but gave his heart. Aww. He has an awesome job now. He is out there seeking and saving the lost. Yes. Douglas probably wouldn't have narrated his life. <laughs> <laughs> he is we, 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 have, we have Jessica. Ooh. My, my daughter. This is God speaking, not she? <laughs> 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 I brought her over to Sydney. She thought it was for a different reason, but I was there training her. Wow. I made sure that she can go through a tough time because my toughest warriors go through the toughest battles. I was making her into a woman of God. She thought that, that Sydney was going to be the end. No, I just called her to another mission team and she went as I expected her to. And I am proud of my daughter. Wow. Right? And that's what the Israelites were feeling. We've done all these things. <laughs> right? So Joshua, he's, he starts building them up. And he's just giving them to this, like, please, guys, do not remember how far you are. Yeah. Remember of how God sees you. Yeah. And he did this, and he did this kind of creativity, uh, with, with creativity. Because he brought this to this place in Shechem. Mm. Shechem was, was an awesome place. If you read here in Genesis verse 35, 2 through 4. It says here, this is way back when. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you, but purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who had been with me wherever I have gone. So they have go uh, gave Jacob all the foreign gods that they had, and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them. Under the oak of Shechem. Mm. You know, this place in Shechem where the trees were was an amazing place where back in Jacob's time was one of the first places where they start to decide to bury their idols and follow God. Mm -hmm. And he brings all of Israel to this place. He says, guys, you remember how, how we gave up our idols before? We need to do that again today. See, 11 through 13 he continues to, to talk to them about all that God has done. And he, God has sent this hornet of God before them to, to provide fear in all of those that were in the promised land and drive everyone out. But in there, he starts to talk about that idolatry starting to get back into their hearts. That hey, we're back in this place. We've, we've left it long ago, but in our hearts, it's starting to come back. So we're going to read here what Joshua says. Him speaking now, not just God, in verse 14 and 15. He says, Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped before the Euphrates, uh, Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day who you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors serve beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of Amorites in those lands who are living. But as for me and my household, I will serve the Lord. He starts to show them all these things at the end of this great and inspiring sermon. What does he say? He says at the end of it, he's like, you know what? At the end of the day, if you don't want to be here, then go serve the other gods. Mm -hmm. Do what you want. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He says, you know, do, do what you want. If you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. That's what he says. See, so many people often get themselves in a place where they have to look to the left or to the right to find out if it's okay to be committed. Oh, as long as everyone else is doing it. As long as I can find other people doing it, it doesn't matter. He said, I don't care what you guys decide to do today. I and myself and my household are going to serve the Lord. And that, that would have been a hard conversation to have. Because this isn't just like a fun sermon he was saying out loud to random people. These were his people. He would have been saying that to Caleb. He would have been saying that to, to, to some other friends that he would have been in the battle for years. They'd be like, hey, you guys do what you want. I am going to serve the Lord. See, to be loyal is to be lonely. You know, many, many, again, I've said this before, many aren't doing what we are doing, but many 
need us to keep doing it. See, this journey is not about reaching a particular end or a particular goal. It's about never quitting. And that's what Joshua was saying to them at this time. Was saying, hey, at the end of my life, I don't care what has gone on before. I today am deciding to continue to serve our God. And the Israelites, how do they respond? They say, hey, we pledge that we will remain to God. We pledge that we will do it. But let's see how G uh, Joshua responds to them in verse 19. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. The Lord, he is holy. He's a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you were forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. See, Joshua, even when they started to commit in word, he says, hey, what you commit in word, you now need to do in action. Yeah. That just because you said it, you can't serve God the way that you're leaving. God is a jealous God. If you say, hey, I'm going to serve God, but I'm still going to have these things on the side. He said, you won't be able to do it. And then they really started to understand the call. See, this was saying that you cannot serve God the way you want while you're holding on to the idols in your life. Yeah. Jesus talks about this as well. Luke 9, verse 62. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. What does, it mean, what does it mean to be not fit for something? I don't know if it's, it's talking about you're using the wrong tool, you're trying to use a hammer to, to screw in like a, a nail or something. Okay, that's not fit for it. I think maybe it also means that you're not physically fit. Saying, hey, you might do the work, but you're not fit for the kingdom. It's kind of like if you're trying to run a marathon with like a backpack on and you have all these burdens on. It's like you're, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna be able to do it. If you're continuing to look back, you are not fit. See, at the end of the day, at the end of his sermon, denounce the gods, hold on to the promises. What he really calls them to do is, hey guys, you just need to make a decision. See, faith is more about the decisions that we make than the beliefs that we have in our heart. It's because Joshua, he realizes since the beginning of his sermon, talking about that partnership he had with God. He was like, this is not just a fun other religion. This is not just a fun thing to do. I understand the relationship I have with God. I am going to continue to serve Him. See, in our lives, we need to decide to follow God and to love Him. That there are going to be many of those that doubt, but you have to say instead, I'm not going to be like them, I'm going to follow God. That my family may worship idols, but no, I'm going to follow God. That the people around me might say, hey, we don't want to do it, but instead, I am going to make that decision to follow God. See, in conclusion, when we talk about the end, we usually are going to ask ourselves, especially if it's the end of our lives, did I love? Did I live? Did I give it all that I have? But I encourage you to ask that now. Because you never know when the end's going to be. But the funny thing is, is, uh, you know, for the, some people, some are like, well, but I haven't lived long enough. Well, to be honest, only non-Christians say that, or Christians who have lost their purpose. Because life, if lived well enough, is long enough. Yeah. I think about it, as living as a Christian, I know I, I went up to Chris, and I said, hey, bro, like, I think we were talking to a, a visitor, but I went up to Chris and I was like, hey, man, do you, do you remember Aaron? And Chris just reminds me, bro, it's only been two months. <laughs> I'm like, do you remember that guy named Aaron? He's like, it's been two months. I'm like, oh yeah, I forget. Like, when you are living a Christian life, I feel like, to be honest, every week is like eternity. Yeah. See, when you are living a Christian life set on a purpose, yeah. like life is long enough. Yeah. God could take me today, and I would say it was a life well lived. Uh -huh. And that's what Joshua. He's coming out to the end of his life. It's like, guys, I'm coming to my end, and I've decided to follow God. Are you going to decide to follow God when you come to your Thank you guys very much. Come on.